Wonderful. I'm so excited. We get to do database DevOps with containers. Welcome to Los Angeles, to Datacon LA. This is so much fun. We're going to build a DevOps pipeline for databases. But before we begin, this is the part where I'm supposed to tell you I will definitely post the slides on my site tonight. <laughs> if ever you find uh, speakers in this conference who say that, I would invite you to challenge them to actually post it. I've been the um, attendee chasing the speaker, and it's never worked out well which is why you can go to robrich.org. Let's go there right now. We'll click on presentations here at the top. And here is database DevOps with containers. The slides and the code up on GitHub are online right now. So head to robrich.org and you can get to both uh, slides and code. It is online right now. While you're here, click on about me and we'll see some of the things I've done recently. I'm a Cyril developer advocate. If ever you wanna talk database security, I will have a lot of fun bending your ear. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, a Docker captain, and a friend of Redgate. I also do a lot with databases, SQL source control basics, minus chapter eight. That was a lot of fun to build. And one of the things I'm particularly proud of, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! <laughs> so there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. So let's dig into database DevOps with containers. We talked about this guy. So DevOps, the goal of DevOps is to build reliability, consistency, and reduce cost. Now, what's really cool is as we get towards automation, we can get computers that do this process really well to take the place of humans that aren't really good at repetitive tasks. And by the way, computers are cheaper than humans now. That wasn't always the case, but it is now. Humans are cheaper than computers. Are, uh, computers are cheaper than humans, rather. So let's automate as much as we can to get the computers to do that work. So let's take a look at a DevOps pipeline. Now, here's my DevOps pipeline. And you'll notice something interesting here. We start with a customer suggestion, and we end by delivering customer value and getting customer feedback. If your DevOps pipeline doesn't start and end with customers, I would invite you to expand your DevOps pipeline to do so. Now, in this case, our DevOps pipeline, a customer suggestion, maybe we'll put that task on a task board, a JIRA board or something. Uh, the developer will check out the code and ultimately commit the changes back to source control. We'll kick off a build, we'll run some tests, deploy that to a pre-production environment, maybe run some additional tests, finally push it to production where we can get customer feedback. If anything fails in this process, we may stop and use that feedback to power our <coughs> power our um, understanding. Now, in this case, if a test fails, maybe it goes not to uh, as a customer suggestion, maybe it goes back to the developer to kick off a new thing. As we talk about shift left, our goal is to shorten this me mechanism so that it can fail quickly and we can learn that without having to go through all of the other steps. That's shift left. So here's a DevOps pipeline for applications. And here's the magic question that I would like to invite you to answer. Where is the master copy? Where is the primary thing that we need that if we lost everything else, we could get back to it? Well, if we have a DevOps pipeline, it's probably this code base. Given this code base, we could check out the code and make more changes. We could build it, test it, deploy it, and finally deploy it to production. For an application DevOps pipeline, our main source of truth is the code base. Well, now let's switch this to a database pipeline. Where's the master copy now? Is it the source code? It's actually the data in the production database. If we lost the data in the production database, we would be sunk. We could make up the schema again. We could adjust some things. We could deploy it into other environments. But if we don't have the production data, then we're not doing so good. So let's build a DevOps pipeline that gets production data into these other environments safely. Now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and we'll have a production, pre-prod, dev test environments, and developer environments where we want to be able to um, move this data safely. So our first step, if we do a uh, here where we back up and then restore, we can think of this as disaster recovery. Let's create a DevOps pipeline that is able to back up our database in an automated way. And if need to, we can 
restore it in an automated way as well. Moving to pre-prod, we're probably going to validate our database. Maybe we need to change connection, see, uh, connection details here, but we're probably not altering very much. As we go to a dev test environment, maybe we need to alter our data. Maybe we need to shrink our database a little bit. Maybe we need to, I'm going to say, anonymize, sanitize, and shrink our data. Let's anonymize it by changing sensitive information, you know, PII data, um, PKI data. Let's anonymize, uh, let's sanitize it by changing any production secrets to dev safe secrets. And let's shrink it by changing the size of our database, deleting excessive data so that we can get it in probably less capable hardware. And as we finally get to a developer's workstation, we'll definitely want to anonymize, sanitize, and shrink this a lot to be able to get it in that environment. So as we're doing this, we're anonymizing, sanitizing, and shrinking our data appropriate for each environment. Anonymize it will change the details. Sanitize will change secrets and shrink. When we shrink, we need to be careful not to change the shape of the data. We're not going to delete everything older than six months. We're not going to delete the biggest customer. Maybe we'll delete customers six through 10. Maybe we'll delete log files. Maybe we'll delete uh, really, really old things. But we want to have the data be as weird as it is in production, because if developers feel the pain of a database query being really slow, then they'll make it not be slow. And then that will benefit users in production as well. Additionally, if we have null fields or wacky data, we want our developers to be able to experience that as well. Because, well, if the data could be null and my code doesn't account for that, then I'm not doing great. So once we anonymize and sanitize and shrink this data, then let's migrate it to the current version using any of migration scripts and finally validate that this database is as we expect. And how are we going to do this? With automation. So let's automate this with containers. Now, Docker containers are really elegant, and we're probably already using them for our applications. Let's use them for databases as well. As an industry, I think we're almost past the what is containers. But just to level set this, how is this better than VMs or Puppet or Chef? Well, with containers, it's not just VM++. Rather, it's container virtualization. We're virtualizing the operating system instead of the hardware. Now, Docker didn't invent virtualization. They just made it really elegant to use. So uh, with virtualization, instead of virtualizing the hardware, we're now virtualizing the operating system. So for example, here's traditional virtualization on the left and containers on the right. We still have a hypervisor. We still have this sandboxing mechanism. But on the left, we start out by installing a guest OS inside each virtual machine. On the right, we only need the difference between our host OS and our guest OS for the containers. Now, this is definitely not to scale. But you can see on the left, we could only get three. And on the right, we get seven. We're using our hardware much more efficiently with containers than with virtual machines. That's really cool. Containers. We virtualize the host operating system. And so we must match the host operating system to be able to run our containers. Now, a lot of our containers are going to be Linux containers that will run on a Linux host. But we could also run Windows containers on a Windows Server host. In development, we probably need to do a little bit more, though. What if we have a Windows desktop or a Mac OS? So here's my Mac OS or my Windows desktop. I've installed Windows. I've installed my hypervisor. In this case, it's Hyper-V. And I'll install a guest OS. Here's Linux. And I'll install the Docker hypervisor in there so that I can run my Linux containers on my Windows OS. In Windows, you can also use WSL2. And that will make this process really elegant. In production, we definitely want to run this way so that we can run as efficiently as possible. The Docker ecosystem. We'll start with a Docker file. This is our configuration as code. We'll build that into an image. We could choose to share these images with others using Docker Hub or another container registry. And we can also pull down images from Docker Hub. Maybe we want to pull down a base image or a data store. And then finally, we'll start that as a container. We can do that with multiple containers. The Docker Compose file references many Docker files or many images on Docker Hub. And we'll build or pull all those images and start them all together. Now, here's a, 
a Docker file that specifies how to get from um, the Microsoft.NET base image to build up our content. Notice we have some copies, some run lines, a from line describing our base image, and finally the CMD line that describes how we'll start this container. Now, when we build this image, what we end up with is, a, is this binary blob. And so if we pull an image for Do Docker Hub, we don't need to recompile it. That's perfect. Now, our de developers are already building these images in containers. And so, uh, for example, I could build a .NET um, Docker file, and each of the commands in that Docker file will be a separate layer. Now, we have that from line, and that from line landed us here on the ASP.NET um, uh, container. And this ASP.NET container, oh, it's moved to here. This ASP.NET container has a Docker file that builds the various things. We can take a look at that Docker file here. And here's the steps to build that Docker file. Now it's based on this image. And so we can see that each of those have the things, <laughs> turtles all the way down. That's perfect. When we start this image as a container, we get a new read-write layer on top so that we can write our changes to disk. Now, we're not changing these underlying layers. We're only changing this read-write layer. Docker is magic. We spin up hardware fast. We get a host name and IP. We can nap traffic into the container. That's amazing. Uh, from a DevOps perspective, inside the container, developers can think of this as a machine. We can arrange all the content in the container, put the uh, files on the table here, arrange the curtains there, put this file in this very specific directory. Once we close the doors on the container, we can use that in standard ways. And so outside the container, we can think of this as a process for operations. We just start it really quickly. We can constrain its memory usage. We can stop it and restart it if we need to. Now, on Docker Hub, we have images for .NET, Node, PHP, and others. But we also have images for databases, Redis, PHP, MyAdmin, WordPress, Postgres, SQL Server. Not all of these are databases. Some of them are DB admin tools. But the cool part is this SQL Server image allows us to run the database as a container. So the SQL Server image, that's pretty cool. We have, uh, in production, you want to use database as a service. On premise, you'll probably use virtual machines. Remember when we weren't, uh, when we were told specifically not to install SQL Server on virtual machines? <laughs> Those were the days. I suspect in time we'll also run SQL Server in containers as a standard setup instead. But in production, you probably want to use a database as a service. Let them worry about point in time restore and authentication details. In dev and test, Let's build a DevOps pipeline that'll get us the uh, last night's production backup, anonymized, sanitized, and shrunk, and in an automated way, embedded in a Docker container so our developers can just Docker pull when they want the latest database. So let's do that. Now, I have a database here. And thanks to randomuser.me, we have some customer data. This is completely, nope, not that one, that one. This is a completely fictitious database. So let's pick that database. But we can see we've got some emails. We've got some other personal identifiable information. If We probably don't want to put this in front of um, developers because we don't want them to accidentally email our customers. We have some invoices. Now, we definitely don't want to trim out all the invoices, but we probably want to shrink the number of invoices just so our database is smaller. And we have some settings. Now, here's a production secret that we definitely don't want to leave production. I also added a build date just so that we can see that we're building content and moving this forward. So first step, let's back up this database. Here's a script that will back it up. And it's not super big, so it backed up really fast. Now we have this uh, database backup file. And there it is. Now let's take a look at the script we'll use to be able to get at this content. Now, this content is up on GitHub. You can go to robrich.org and pull up database DevOps with containers and get to exactly this, um, this system. So here's that database folder, and we'll take a look at this script. 
This script is the process of migrating our database from a production system to a development environment. So we need to anonymize and sanitize and shrink the data appropriate for that environment. Let's start by copying, by uh, restoring the database. We'll move it to a particular location. And then let's up update those email addresses to just a random string at contoso.com. Now that will ensure that we don't modify, uh, we don't get real data in front of developers. Next, let's update our secrets with dev safe secrets for the API key and we'll set the date just so that we can see that we've done this. We'll delete some data from our invoice log. In this case, we're one equals zero, so we're not gonna delete anything, but we could trim out the data. We want to maintain the weirdness of our database, but we'll get it to a point where we can uh, deploy it into users' data stores without a whole lot of fuss. Next, I'm gonna shrink my database file. I'm gonna set it to recovery mode simple so that I don't need the transaction log. I'm going to uh, shrink the database, shrink the log file, and finally um, fix the orphaned user if I have one. Next, I'm gonna change the SA password. In case developers need to log into the database and make administrative changes, then they have a safe password that is not the production password. So that's the script that we want to run. And this will get our production data in a production data store ready for a developer. Anonymize, sanitize, and shrunk. Now, how do we do it? Here's a, a Docker file that starts with SQL Server 2019. We'll accept the EULA, we'll set the password as our production password. And because this is an environment, we could inject in the password if we wanted to, as opposed to setting it right here. Next, let's copy in that production database backup and the script that we're gonna run. Then we'll start up SQL Server, we'll accept the EULA, we'll sleep for a bit, and we have to guess how long it'll take for SQL Server to spin up. So in this case, I guessed 80 seconds. I've seen it spin up sometimes in as fast as 20 seconds. Sometimes it takes more like a minute and a half. Then we're gonna run SQL command with logging in. Ideally, we would use this environment variable, but I just copied it to, to so, so that we could see it. We'll run that script. And then once that script finishes, and has committed that content into the data store, then we'll kill SQL Server. Next, let's start a new container. Each of these layers is cached by Docker. So just removing this database backup isn't sufficient to be able to remove it from our database, uh, our Docker container. That won't make our container smaller. So we'll start a new image. We'll accept the EULA, the SA password is already set, and we'll copy all of our data stores from this image up here to our new image. So let's run it. I'm here in that directory. I have my database backup. I have my script. I have my Docker file. <coughs> Docker build. Let's tag this dev database dot. Now this is going to take a minute because we do need to wait that 80 seconds for SQL Server to spin up. But I love watching it spin up because not only is it going to do all the things, but we also can watch that database upgrade process as well. That's really cool. So here's SQL Server spinning up. SQL Server on Linux is really elegant in that it is binary compatible with our Windows system. Note that we backed up our database on Windows and we're gonna restore it on Linux. That's really cool. So here comes SQL Server, it's on its way up. <gasps> go, go, go. I love that, watching the thing spin up. And in a minute, we're gonna see the how it upgrades the database. Um, there we go, there we go. So we want to get to 904 and we had 897, so it's gonna upgrade that database automatically. That's cool. Now in this case, it looks like our database is spinning up pretty quickly, but we'll still need to wait that 80 seconds. In time, I hope Microsoft makes this container so that we can get a call back when the uh, database is spun up rather than just having to wait. But now that we've got our data store spun up, the next thing for us to do is to run that script. So it'll do all of the steps of anonymizing, sanitizing, and shrinking our data. We might have a different script like this for the different environments, one for our pre-production environment that will probably only migrate it a little bit, one for dev and test servers that might only trim some of the data. We don't need to get it quite as small and then one for development that will get it to be really small. So once our database is up, now we're doing the upgrade for our database. 
we'll run that script. And once our script is done, we set it into uh, simple mode and we fix our orphaned users. And finally, we get our container built. We're flipping over to the new image and copying that content. And now Docker image list, we have this new container that we built right now. There's that dev database container. Perfect. Now let's run it. So I'm going to say Docker run. I will forward port 1433 to port 1433 in the container. And I'm going to run that dev database container. Now the cool part is since we've got our database inside the container, we don't need to map any volumes. We don't need to do any uh, fuss there. We will need to wait for it to copy the data store into the read write layer. So if your database is particularly large, you may notice that the connections may time out until the database gets fully booted. But now that we've got our database up, let's connect to it from our other environment. So I'm going to pop back into SQL Management Studio, and I'm going to connect to this database. And in this case, I'm running Minikube, so I will connect to the host Minikube. I will log in with my DevSafe password. And now I am connected to the database. Now here's the database. From SQL Management Studio, we can see all of the tables. We could do this from Azure Data Studio as well. There's our tables, customer invoice settings. We've got all of the content in place. Let's create a new query here on our dev database and run these queries again. So I'm going to, oops, copy, paste. Let's go look at our customer data. Now, we can see in our customer data that we have changed those email addresses. So we won't accidentally email customers. We could choose to sanitize other data, like uh, changing first name and last name, or changing address details. In this case, we left it alone. We can see that we've trimmed the invoice log. In this case, all of the invoices were 1 equals 0. So <laughs> we still have our invoices. And looking at our settings, we can see that we sanitized that data. We now have a dev safe API key. And we've got the build date set to, well, looks like I messed up that key. I'll need to go debug that later. So we got to a database. We built a database that is now inside of a container. And the beautiful thing here is that whenever the user needs to change, uh, whenever the user needs to change, uh, upgrade the data store, they can just Docker pull the latest piece and they'll have that content in place. That's excellent. So you can grab this code from GitHub. It's online right now. Head to robrich.org, click on Presentations, and grab Database DevOps with Containers. Now, that was really cool. We got to see SQL Server on Linux. And what was really elegant was it is binary compatible between Windows and Linux. We backed up on Windows, and we restored on Linux. The only real difference here was that when we built this, we needed to use Linux PaaS, var opt MS SQL instead of C program files. That's pretty cool. So here in uh, SQL Server on Linux, we have binary compatibility uh, for all of our data stores. We also include SQL CLR and the SQL agent, which is really helpful. Machine learning and agent-based replication are available now on Linux, which is really helpful. There are some features that are not available for SQL Server on Linux. We don't have reporting services. We don't have analysis services, because both of those require um, integration into IIS. And we don't have IIS on Linux. So it doesn't make sense for us to have these services. Now, this was really effective at building up a DevOps pipeline. So if a developer wants a latest copy of the database, they can just Docker pull to get this content. We can create a similar script for our pre-production environments, for our dev test servers. And as soon as that production database finishes, we can kick off these pipelines that will restore our data, anonymize, sanitize, and shrink it appropriate for every environment, and bake it into a container, pushing that into our container registry. The cool part is you may choose, as part of a, a regular application build, to pull down the latest production database backup, uh, production uh, the dev safe production data container, and migrate it to the latest version and then run all of your integration tests. The beautiful thing there is that because you have 
practice that migration, when it comes time to push to production, you've already done all of that migration work. You've already run those database scripts a lot, and that's perfect. So we'll integrate this Docker build command into a Jenkins pipeline or a GitHub Actions pipeline. The moment production backup finishes, we can kick off these processes to make it automatic. Now, this is really cool. If a developer burns down their database, forgets to put in a where clause, they can just Docker pull and get a new data store. The DBA can stay asleep. That's really cool. This has been really fun getting to show you database DevOps with containers. Um, I love the opportunity to be able to show you how we can get our data from production into development environments safely. If you're watching this video later, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich, and let's continue the conversation. You can grab these slides and code right now on robrich.org. And for those of you here live in the conference, what are your questions? What are your thoughts? Do you think this is appealing to you? Would you incorporate it in your de DevOps pipeline? Well, hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Uh, yes. I've got a couple of questions. Just uh, uh, most definitely. Just basically uh, speaking out of, well, that I have not used databases and containers. So this is all new to me. Uh, are there any high <laughs> concerns with, uh, well, either restarting or just having your database backups in uh, in container. I mean, if you're going to be refreshing your database, for instance. Uh, Are there any data integrity say, concerns? A high availability. High availability. Now, towards a high availability system, in time, we'll probably run our production data store in containers as well. But right now, here in dev and test, uh, high availability is less of a concern. You know, our goal is to uh, iterate quickly on our application. So in this case, uh, we haven't focused on high availability, but in the same way that you can run SQL Server in high availability on uh, out of virtual machines or on bare metal, you can do that in containers as well. You have to do a little bit more with stateful sets rather than uh, just regular pods, but yes, you can get to high availability within containers. What's really elegant about stateful sets, I actually have a completely different talk that digs into this quite a bit, Stateful sets allow you to, when you kill off the container, to restart that container with the exact same name. So then your clients know how to connect to it in a really elegant way. <laughs> Which is always nice for those of us who have, yes. The, the, <laughs> the, yes, we've all been there. Uh, what, yes. about, what about scale, if you have a particularly large database? Now, that's one of the things that you can definitely tune for your organization is scale. In this case, SQL Server will scale as much as you need to. You can make databases as big or as small as you need to, and it will consume the resources in your container environment in the same way that it would have consumed your resources in a virtual machine or on your physical machine. But you can get as big as you want. As we create these scripts to make the databases appropriate for each environment, we might want to tune that scale. So maybe we say, I know our production database is two gigs, but let's say if we can get it to 500 megs for developers so they don't have to pull a new two gig image every time they want to update their database. Now, that is definitely tunable in that script. You could choose to delete more or less data, but make sure that you don't change the shape of the data. You want to make sure that your database is as weird for developers as it is in production. Okay. So you might not want to do this with your data warehouse. Uh, maybe. You know, as I said, remember the days when we weren't supposed to run our database in, in virtual machines? Yeah. I suspect in a short amount of time, we'll run our databases in containers as well. Uh, are there any versions? Is this a new development with regard to the binary compatibility between Windows and Linux? Or are there any versions of SQL Server which aren't? Or maybe additions which aren't, like standard or... Yeah. The free version? Actually, what's really elegant is as they were building SQL Server on Linux, they made sure that they had that binary compatibility with the data stores all the way along. In some older versions of SQL Server on Linux, you may not have quite as many features, but uh, the database engine and the agent 
and even SQL CLR have been there from the beginning. Oh. That's pretty amazing to be able to get SQL CLR, you know, .NET framework <laughs> running inside of Linux. That's no easy feat. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, analysis services and reporting services, which uh, uh, are not compatible. Uh, what about right. SIS packages? I haven't tried SSIS packages inside of SQL Server on Linux, but for the most part, I would expect that they would work just fine. Um, one of the things that I have noticed about SSIS though is the packages can be a, a little bit fragile. I would, uh, I've migrated some systems from SSIS into Kafka queues so that we now have an event stream. And if ever the message goes weird, we can replay the message or uh, pull the message from the dead letter queue and be able to reprocess it. Um, an event stream might be a more durable choice than SSIS packages. Hmm. Okay. So you mentioned, what about service broker? I don't think anybody's used that in a while, but I still see <laughs> that occasionally. Yeah, I'm not sure. Now I want to go look at the feature list of SQL Server. From what I understand, reporting services and analysis services are the only things that aren't binary comp that aren't um, exactly the same between Windows and Linux um, on SQL Server 2019. Wow. That's yeah, cool. that's amazing. <laughs> One of the questions I often get is, uh, does this work with other databases? Could I use this technique with maybe Postgres or MySQL? Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing that's SQL Server specific. I like to use SQL Server as my example because SQL Server is really weird and has historically been very tied to Windows. And so to be able to show it running inside of a Linux container can be really powerful. But you could use the same technique using a, a MySQL SQL script and a Docker file that is based on the MySQL database instead. Hmm. I, I would expect that NoSQL databases would probably be fine in this case. Yeah. I would expect that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this this is... technique would work great with Mongo as well. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, if there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And we still have a few more minutes. I often get mobbed by questions. So I wanted to give you give us lots of spot to be able to dig into all the things. But I understand you know, coming off mute or um, typing in chat may be a little, um, <laughs> we've lost social skills having not <laughs> been outside for years. Um, oh, one thing, I, one thing I wanted you to talk a little bit about, because you're talking about, well, Actually, would you talk about any security concerns, either uh, with regard to the containers or maybe even inside the containers? With, you know, I mean, if you've got live data, and any anything special about having the live data in the containers that you might be concerned about? I am concerned as the schema changes. You know, we built a script that was very specific to the version of our data schema that we had at the time, and so if we were to add new fields that included sensitive data. We would also need to update this sanitization script to be able to migrate those fields as well. If, for example, we have GDPR concerns or PKI concerns, we want to stay on top of that to make sure that we keep our data in sync. Now, some have suggested instead of copying our production data and just mangling it, could we generate new data based on the patterns that we see? And we definitely could. But if we generate random data, then we're not getting that same data shape, you know, really, really bulky customers. And that customer that somehow ended, entered their phone number in the address field. And I don't know how somebody got a null last name, but you know, we want all of those wacky pieces to be in the development environments as well. And so there are some concerns, especially with right to be forgotten of, you know, if I take my production data and I put it in a, in a container and that may end up on a developer's database, is there a concern there? Uh, you know, ultimately we haven't litigated that to know for sure, but arguably because we've sanitized it, we've anonymized it, we've um, de-productionized the data to the level that we're comfortable, then we've gotten that data into a, a very specific randomized state that is less worrisome in that way. 
Now, if that definitely is a concern of yours that you don't want that data to ever leave the secure environment, well, first let's talk about zero trust, but then you may choose to have these in containers and spin up the containers on a known Kubernetes host, not make them available for developers to pull to their local machine. And in that case, you keep the same mechanism of getting production-like data into non-production environments, but the containers never leave your uh, local environment, your LAN. And that can be a decent solution as well. All right. Cool. Well, uh, if anybody has any questions, please place them into the Q&A. Otherwise, we are coming. One of the questions I often get here are, are there any tools that can help me with anonymizing this data? You know, either discovering the fields that I should manipulate or creating randomized kind of simu normal data. Uh, Redgate has data masker that is specifically geared for this. And so you can point it at a particular column and say, this is a last name like column and it will go generate a whole bunch of random last names or this is a phone number column. It'll generate a whole lot of random phone numbers. And so if you wanna integrate Data Masker into this process, just kick off the Data Masker um, executable and you can fire it at those columns that you need to. And at that point, you're, you know, what is the script to do it? Is a configuration file inside the Data Masker rather than a SQL command. But the process is still the same. You know, ultimately from that Docker file, you'll uh, restore the database, you'll get it ready to go. You'll kick off Data Masker to do that anonymization and finally save that data back into the container in a really elegant way. Wow. That's a, that's a great tip. Yeah. Uh, we are coming to the end of our session. We do have a few minutes left, but well, two minutes. <laughs> yeah, two minutes. So, uh, I would like to thank everybody, and definitely you, Rob, for a great talk. And hope that uh, this is the last session of the day. We will have plenty more tomorrow and on Sunday. So yeah. I hope everybody has a great weekend, has a great evening and a great rest of Datacon LA 2021. Yeah, and if thanks for joining any... us in Los Angeles today. This has been so much fun. <laughs> uh, I'm in Grand Rapids. Ooh, I'm in Grand Rapids too today. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not, but that's all right. Uh, any parting words? <coughs> It was really fun to get to present this. I often notice that shortly after I disconnect from a talk, I'm like, oh, I meant to ask the person this thing. Yes. Um, my Twitter is Rob underscore Rich. So if you find that question in a minute or an hour or tomorrow or next week, hit me up on Twitter and let's continue the conversation. Let's see if you get um, similar experiences with this technique in your environment too. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. I think it usually takes a little time to digest and then the questions come up. Agreed. Thank you all. And with that, have a good night. Yep. Good night, everyone.